Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. Um, pray with me as we come to our, our message today. Spirit, we, in, we invite you to come and to speak to us as we, as we look at your word, as we spend time wanting to hear from you and wanting to have um, you empower us to be about your work and your ministry here. Lord, I, I do, I ask that you take down any sort of walls, any distractions that would be um, barriers in place of us um, hearing from you. And Lord, we, we welcome you. We want to be your uh, students. We want you to be our teacher. Uh, so please say what you will. Um, you give me clarity, give me clear um, communication so that we are able to listen, but ultimately let your words stick and let my words fade away. We ask this in Jesus' name. Well, we are starting a new series in the book of Acts, and I'm really excited because it's been a little while since we've walked through um, just a passage of Scripture. We've done some themes and some topical series for a little while, and now we're going to go back to just let's go through a book of the Bible. That'll be good. Um, Last week, we did. We had our missions conference, and Tim challenged us to get in the game. And by that, what he meant was, God is doing something around the world. God is on mission, and he wants you to be a part of that. He wants you to have your lives in all of it submitted and surrendered to him so that as he leads and works in your community, you're in the center of what he's doing. And the cool thing that what I liked about what Tim said was he said the very best thing in the world is to be a missionary in Taiwan for me. Because God has called Tim to be a missionary in Taiwan. So the very best thing in the world for Tim was to do that. But he said, for you, it's going to be something else. And I want to encourage us, and, and I love that challenge. What is that something else? What does it mean for us to be in the center of God's will? That brings us to Acts. Acts is the story of the beginning of the church. If Genesis is a book about beginnings, and you have the beginning of the universe and the beginning of the redemptive story, you have the beginning of the family of Abraham, then Acts is the story of new beginnings of God's church and of his people. It's the story of the acts or the actions of the apostles, but it's the story about the acts of the Spirit just as much. Because the Spirit is the one who empowers the disciples, who empowers the apostles to do anything extraordinary. It's the Spirit who carries the message of Jesus from this backwater town of Jerusalem all the way across the Roman Empire into its very capital city, Rome. It's the Spirit's work. And the cool thing is, as we read these stories that come out of the book of Acts, and we see what this church was like 2,000 years ago, we realize that we are the same church, only 2,000 years older. And so the expectations that we have of what is possible, what is God doing, what is his mission for us, is inspired and is heightened and grows as we read more and more and we get to know the church that God is making in the first century. So Acts Chapter 1, we're going to read the first 14 verses. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staling with them, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. 
And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. A cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Acts 1, 1 through 14, that's from the ESV. There's a lot happening in that opening section. And the thing that I'm going to focus in on this morning is a transition that's taking place. So in the first three verses, you see Luke, the author, describe a previous work. He says, in the first book, O Theophilus. What he's referencing is his gospel. So Luke and Acts are Luke's contribution to scripture. And it's this history that he presents to us in two volumes. And they're meant to be, in a sense, read together. They carry some of the same themes, and and they work together to provide a witness to a person named Theophilus. Now, Theophilus is either a specific individual, or he's a type of person. He represented, like I might say, I'm writing this to all of the lovers of God out there. We don't necessarily know for sure, but in any case, Luke is writing to this person, and he wants them to have this history of events. And this is the second set. So the first three verses summarize his gospel, and he says that in the first book, what I did was I focused on an individual. I focused on Jesus. The life and the ministry of Jesus propelled the plot forward as he taught We listened, and finally, as we've watched him walk to his death and then to his resurrection, we come to a conclusion about who he is. He's the Son of God, that he's the Savior of the world. But now Luke is writing his second work. And by the time we get to verses 13 through 14, we see that Luke has transitioned from a a book that talked about Jesus as the main character. Now he is looking at the followers of Jesus as his main characters. And the people who believed in Jesus and listened to Jesus and then followed him and formed the beginning church are the people that he's going to be writing about now and the stories he's going to be telling now. And as they interact with the world around them, Luke's plot in Acts is going to move forward. But if you were to ask me, would you like to read a book about Jesus or a book about people who followed Jesus? I would choose the one about Jesus. And if, I, if I'm thinking about, like, which of these, you know, like, which of these is going to be more beneficial to me, which of these is going to be more helpful for me, the one that directly allows me to look at who Jesus is is going to be the one that I'm going to get excited about. And yet the book of Acts is a part of Scripture. The book of Acts is equally inspired by God. The Holy Spirit has come upon Luke not just to write the story of Jesus, but to write the story of the beginning church. So what does God have to say to us in this? Well, to begin with, we can see why it's worth including in Scripture when we look at verses 4 through 7. In verses 4 through 7, we see this promise that Jesus gives the disciples. He says to them that I'm going to bring something to you. I'm going to do something in you and through you that's going to empower you to be my witnesses, empower you to carry the message about me to the rest of the world, from Jerusalem to your neighbors in Judea, to the people who share similar worldviews to you but you don't get along with in Samaria, and to really people who are nothing like you in the ends of the earth. And in verses 4 through 7, what Jesus promises is that the Holy Spirit is going to be given to them that he's going to come down and baptize them, that they are going to 
not just be speaking their own words and using their own eloquence and telling their own stories about Jesus, but the Spirit is going to work through them in order to witness to the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead and he is the Savior of the world. And when that is what we're looking for in Acts, when we are looking for the way that the Holy Spirit witnesses through regular, ordinary people, that's worth reading. That is very much so something that we need to hear and to be challenged by. That's something that begs us to ask, well, if we are the church as well, then how is the Holy Spirit witnessing through us? What does the Spirit want to do through us? And how are we yielded to the plan of God in our lives? So as we read Acts, and as over the course of the next couple of months as we go through this book, as, as we do that, I want us to be encouraged by the fact that these are just people. They're, they're, they're normal humans. There's nothing special about Paul. There's nothing special about Peter. In fact, there's stories that are included by Luke simply to make the point that these men should not be worshipped. These men should not be lifted up as something more than other people. They are like you and they're like me. They've submitted themselves to the plan of God. They're obedient. And because of that, God is growing his church through them, through the witness of his spirit. We should be asking questions like, if we're the same church, if we're empowered by the same spirit, what does it mean for us to be Jesus' witnesses here in the Twin Cities? We should also be asking questions like, how do I take, how do I imitate Peter and how do I imitate Paul and their witness and their obedience and their faithfulness? But how do I do that in the 21st century? It isn't enough for us to simply say, Here is, here's what they did, now I'm going to go do the same exact thing. We have to ask, why did they do what they did? And how do I bring that into my world? And that's where I really want to spend our time this morning. How do we read the book of Acts? Now, th there are some faithful church traditions that say Acts is essentially a blueprint. Acts was given to us so that we can look at what God intends the church to be. And it, as we see Acts and the, the Acts of the Apostles, and as they do this, then what we do is we take that and we bring it over and then we live it out here. And then we look to see what the next thing was that happened in Acts. And we take that and we bring it over and we live it out here. And it's this blueprint that tells us how to do church. It's the pure form of the church. And then there's other faithful churches that will say the exact opposite. And they're going to go and they're going to say, you know what's happening in Acts is an incredible moment in redemptive history when the covenant from Moses is fulfilled in Jesus and Jesus installs a new covenant that moves forward, and because we're now in this new covenant, Acts is given to us to document the transition, to mark how God took his people being defined by their nationality, and he pushed that back, and he changed it so that the, his people would be defined by their faith. And this church tradition will tend to read the book of Acts as if it has a do not try this at home sticker on it. And they say these are things that happened, but we don't need to expect that they will happen again. These are things that are amazing, but our lives are our lives, and they're distant from those days. And to be honest, there's really faithful followers of Christ in both camps who would argue persuasively for either way of looking at it. But I think more than listening to what different scholars would have to say, it probably would be valuable for us to listen to what the author thinks we should do with his book. Remember, Luke and Acts are both written by this guy, Dr. Luke. And he has a goal in mind for why he wrote. He wrote to Theophilus. He wanted Theophilus to have these histories, have this account. And he wanted Theophilus to read what he had to say with some sort of a response to have some sort of desired outcome from his stories, from his biographies. 
And we can kind of get a glimpse of that when we go to the beginning of the work in Luke chapter 1. In Luke 1, 1 through 4, he says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So Luke writes to Theophilus. He says, I know you've already heard the gospel. Other people have written about it. You know, there's been other people who've already told you what the gospel is. And I'm not trying to tell you that there's something you're missing. I'm not trying to get you to uh, think about it differently. I'm writing to you, Theophilus, because you've heard these things, and I want you to know that they are true. I want you to have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So the book of Luke and the book of Acts are presented by the Dr. Luke as his eyewitness accounts or his collection of eyewitness accounts to provide, if you will, the support beams for the bridge of the gospel. So the gospel's already gone out, and he says, it's good, it's true, you need to believe it. And now here are some supporting stories. Here are some evidences for you that it really has transformed the lives of Peter. It really did wreck Paul and turn him into something completely different. He went from being a Pharisee to being the first missionary. Only the gospel can transform life like this. So Luke and Acts work together, according to what Luke's saying here, to form sort of an apologetic for the faith, a defense of the truthfulness of the gospel. They work together. These stories speak for themselves, and they beg us to believe the gospel message that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus reconciles us to God. So the first thing, the first priority that we have as we read Acts is going to be ask, is going to ask, what is Luke trying to encourage us to believe? Why did he include this story? W why did he use the same words here and here? Why did he do these things so that we could believe the gospel in some way? What is he trying to get at? What is he encouraging or supporting about the gospel message? But the second thing is, if we're supposed to read this also that we would believe a gospel message. And what we're reading are stories of other people who believe that same gospel message. Then it, it sort of beckons us or prods us and, and pokes us so that we start thinking, if Peter lived this way because he believed the message, shouldn't I live this way? Or if things like this happened to Paul, because he was motivated by the gospel and God called him into this and then he followed him, should I expect things like that to happen to me if I follow Jesus, if I submit to him as Lord? And so as we read Acts, the first thing, of course, is what does this say about Jesus? How does this support our faith? How does this help us have certainty concerning the things that have occurred? And right underneath that, as the subpoint is, so then how do you fit into the story? What does this mean for the way you live? What does this mean now that you believe this and you have certainty about this? How does this teach you how to live as a disciple of Jesus? Because this man Peter and this man Paul are really no different than you. They're just people who are following Jesus. They just did it 2,000 years ago. So it's not as simple as saying it's a blueprint that just tells us what to do and here's how you do life. That's not what Luke was writing about. And neither is Luke simply just describing events. But he has a goal in mind of helping us engage with the gospel, helping us believe it, and helping us live it out. 
And while as we read the stories, I think often we can get excited about what these stories claim about Jesus, the questions about how do I bring this into my context can be more challenging or more confusing. For example, is Pentecost something that should recur in each person's life? Or is it a singular event that encourages us to, to see as Jesus as faithful to bring the Spirit to his church? When the disciples all come together and there's the church is l- growing underneath Peter's teaching and they're all living together and they're sharing all of their food in common and no one is considering anything really their own but it's all held in common, is that an incredible moment in history that shows the impact of the gospel then, or is that something that's calling all of us to live that way, where we don't consider our things to be held privately but in common? And not everybody agrees. I want to give us a couple guidelines as we read Acts to try to wade through and ask the questions, how do we fit into the story? So the first question, of course, is going to be, what is this gospel saying about Jesus? That's the first thing. We can see that. The second piece, then, is how do we fit in? And I want to encourage us to see, con- look at context. When we read a single story in Acts, we should look at wh- where that story is in the book of Acts. What else does the story say about it? And we're going to do a test example here in a second. But pay attention to what comes before and what comes after. Not only look at the context of the whole book of Acts, but go out of Acts and go into the story of the Bible. Why does this occur? And is this similar to anything else that's happened? Is this a fulfillment of prophecy? Is this instead a um, some sort of event that gets repeated later on in other places? And as we read these stories, I encourage you to look at the heart of the characters to ask the question, well, why did Peter do that? What was he, what was motivating him in acting this way? We have to be really humble about this because the scripture doesn't say Peter did X because of Y. It says Peter did X. And so in humility, we ask the question, well, why did he do that? And we're going to have to look around in order to let scripture feed in and and teach us. And so go back to context. But try to look at the heart of the characters. Next, we want to check in the book of Acts, is this event repeated somehow? Is this something that occurs over and over and over again? Because that might give us a hint as to whether we are supposed to continue repeating it. For example, when people are in prison in Acts, we often see the church praying for them over and over and over again. That's something that we can probably take out of Acts and just straight apply to our life. When we see people who are in prison for the sake of the gospel, we should be praying for them. And then lastly, what is the result of the event? And this is definitely connected to the context piece, but it's it's significant. How does the event, how do the actions, how do the things that happen turn out? Because that's Luke's way of hinting and nodding at whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. And so you have Ananias and Sapphira. How does that turn out? Pretty poorly. Probably don't want to repeat that. Right? Or how about, maybe more difficult, Paul, when he's coming back to Jerusalem and he's trying to connect with the Jewish people there, he takes the advice to adopt some of the customs or occultic practice. So he he joins with these vows. And how does that turn out? Well, that actually doesn't go so well either. What is Luke trying to say there? And so we look at the results to try to discern if God is blessing this activity or if if something's not working out quite right and, and why did that happen. So pay attention to how the story ends. Let's look at it in an example. We'll just stay right within our first 14 verses. Acts 1, 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. 
and jump down to verse 9. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. So here we have a little short story. It's got a beginning where Jesus gives a command. He says, you're going to have to wait here for the promised spirit. And then we skipped a little bit, but then it gets to the next point where Jesus returns and he goes up and he ascends into heaven. The disciples don't know what to make of it. And they're standing there dumbfounded, just looking into the skies. And then two angels are given to them to get them back on track and say, hey, you know, he's gone into heaven now. He will return. You need to be about obedience to the final command he gave you. So the disciples are like, oh, yeah, that's right. And they go back to Jerusalem and they wait. So first, what does it say about the gospel? How does this encourage us to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and he can do what he said he can do? Well, in a lot of resurrection stories, they are witnessed, first of all, by like one or two people and there's a lot of like sort of distance or ethereal nature to the story. It's like, oh, we saw this guy raised and he was standing on the rooftop over there. And I think, yeah, that's him. And he's raised from the dead. And then they never encounter him again. And it's like one or two people's witnesses. But here we have a story where the disciples are all gathered in conversation with Jesus. He's raised from the dead with multiple witnesses. But he's not just like Lazarus, who lived out the rest of his life and died. Before these witnesses, in the middle of a conversation with these witnesses, Jesus is raised up and brought to heaven to be with the Father. Paul later talks about that, and he says that Jesus has been highly exalted, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, even now. And this moment, this this event, is done before us for us to witness. And it's recorded by Luke so that we could see that Jesus is not just another guy, but he is the Son of God who has been exalted by God and raised to be up in heaven, and we are witnesses of the fact. So then what does it say about us? How do we fit into that story? First, do you think that we should expect that this event reoccurs in our life? As we read Acts, are we going to read it and say, okay, so this happened to them. They were followers of Jesus, so Jesus probably is going to meet me and then before me ascend into heaven again. No, no. no. I mean, it's pretty intuitive to feel that that's not what's happening here. That we're, Luke did not give us this story so that we could be praying and looking into heaven, wondering if today is the day that Jesus is going to envision, come to us, and then rise up to heaven again. But why? Why do we know that? How do we figure that out? Well, it's because first we look at context. And this event doesn't occur again in Acts. It, it doesn't exist anywhere else. It's a single moment. And then you back out again and you look at the rest of Scripture and you look at the Gospels and they talk about this same event, but it only happens the one time. And then as you get into some of the Gospels, or excuse me, the Epistles, Paul's explaining that this is the moment when Jesus returns to heaven to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords at the right hand of the Father. And And within the story itself, in these 14 verses, Jesus is saying, I'm going to the Father now, and I'm sending my spirit to you so that my kingdom will expand. My kingdom will move forward through the power of the spirit witnessing in you and through you. And even, again, like digging into, like, what's happening here? What's the context? You even have two angels coming down, And speaking into the story, saying, you should not be looking into heaven right now, expecting to see him again. You're supposed to be about the commands that Jesus has given you. You're supposed to get back on track 
and, and go back to Jerusalem. So the context tells us that this isn't something that we're supposed to be expecting to happen again. Well, what about the heart of the characters? How do we look at the heart of the characters here? Well, we can see first the attitude of the, of the disciples is first just wonder. They're watching this happen, and their response is just pr- trying to process and not being able to. That's good. That is how we should encounter Jesus. Wondering at who he is and what he's done. But then they get hung up on the fact that they're gazing into the clouds. And so as they're hung up on that, the angels come and they correct them. And they say, you're not supposed to be looking up here right now. He'll come back when he comes back. You can't control that. What did he tell you to do? And then they take, you see, a heart of repentance in the disciples and in the apostles. Because they receive the admonition and they turn back to obedience of Jesus and going back to Jerusalem. So wonder and they also model repentance for us. As they go back, we see anticipation. They believe that Jesus is going to follow through, that he's going to send the Spirit. Otherwise, why would they have gone back? And throughout all of it, we see faith. That they believed what Jesus said. They believed what the angels said to them. And they trusted him. And those heart characteristics are definitely things that we can take home. That we can ask the question, well, how do I worship and wonder at Jesus in the 21st century? How do I take Jesus' words to me as of correction? And how do I repent today? How do I anticipate his second coming? How do I live a life of faith? And we can see ourselves in the story. If we look at the result of the event, we, we kind of hit repetition already. But if we look at the result of the event, the obedience of the disciples, the faithfulness of the disciples as they listen to what Jesus said, as Jesus ra- goes up to heaven and they go back and wait in Jerusalem, it's outside of our first 14 verses, but we see Jesus coming through because Pentecost happens. And the Spirit does come and the Spirit does fill them. And so as they listen to God and they trust Jesus and they wait in prayer, the ending of the story is super positive. And there's an encouragement for us to repeat their heart attitudes. There's an encouragement for us to just as they listened to Jesus' words, we should listen to Jesus' words. Just as they were willing to wait and and pray as they were instructed, that was the mission that was given them, we should pay attention to the mission that's been given us. As we conclude this morning, and we're thinking about the next couple months that are coming up, we're going to be unpacking themes. We're going to be looking at Acts, and we're going to be asking the question, first and foremost, what is Luke witnessing to about Jesus? What is he showing us about Jesus' witness in that first century church? We're going to unpack those themes. And I'm really excited about this. I'm really excited to dig into Acts and see how Luke was saying this gospel is completely worthy of your trust. You can believe in Jesus. We want to grow as a church. We want to grow not just for the sake of growth, but we want to realize that we are part of God's thing. This is God's deal, and we're his people. We want to grow healthy and become healthier than we are now. We want to grow healthily for the right reasons. We want to learn from the example of the first century church. We want to be in the center of God's will for us. We're going to ask, what does it say about Jesus? And we're going to ask, how do we fit into it? And I encourage you, if, you, if you're in the middle of your, your Bible reading plans for the year, that's, that's great, you can keep going. But if you want to take some time to work through Acts with us in, on your own, and start developing your own questions, and start developing your own observations. I'd love that. Do that. And let's get excited about what God's doing in this church. Um, Let me pray for us.